morning and welcome to our worship service. Although we're not able to meet physically, we do join our hearts together in Christ as we worship and give thanks to God the Father. Our call to worship is a selection of verses from our opening singing, which will be Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. What is man that you're mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings, and crowned him with glory and honour. You've given him dominion over the works of your hands. You've put all things under his feet. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We want to worship together by singing from this psalm, Psalm 8. It's the A version of the psalm, and we're going to be singing stanza 1 and then stanzas 4 to 7. And the tune is Gainsborough, number 91. The words of Psalm 8 are quoted in the New Testament in Hebrews chapter 2, and it's referring to the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The coming of the Son of God into the world, taking on human flesh, being born of a woman. In Psalm 8, we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honour because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. The glory of God has stepped down into the world. He has humbled himself that we can have life, that we can give him praise, glory and honour. We sing together Psalm 8a, singing stanza 1 and 4 to 7. And I would encourage you where you are at home, if you're able, to stand and join with us as we sing in praise.
O oh Lord, this morning as we gather together for worship, we do say, how excellent in all the earth, Lord, our Lord, is your name. And we come to you, the mighty, majestic, glorious God, Father, Son, and Spirit. We come humbly this morning because you are above all things. You're the one who is creator and sustainer. You're the one full of power, glory, and holiness. You're the one who has not just created all things and sustains all things, but you also have a perfect plan and purpose. And we thank you that this plan and purpose involved your glory coming to earth, stepping down into this creation, taking on the very form of your creation, becoming man. We thank you that God the Son was born to Mary. We thank you that he grew as a child to a young man. We thank you that he humbled himself and that he was obedient to you, the Father in heaven. We thank you that Jesus Christ willingly subjected himself to the sufferings and the miseries of this life. We thank you that he lowered himself, lower than the angels, even going to the cross. And especially, Lord, we thank you that he died for our sin, that we can be raised up, that we can have life. We thank you that there on the cross, Jesus Christ endured the full wrath of you, the Father, because of our sin. And so we rejoice this morning that through Jesus Christ, we can approach you through the one who died for us, through the one who gave himself on the cross, through the one whose blood was shed to pay the price for our sin and our rebellion. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And how much more so when we consider the glory of salvation, where Christ humbled himself for us, for he became poor for our sake, that we might have life and life eternal. And so this morning, Father, we do give thanks to you. And we pray that you'll draw close to us in our time of worship, in the places where we are, in our own homes. O oh Lord, might we know your presence with us by your Spirit, leading us into your truth, showing us more of Christ. This morning, Father, we pray that our hearts will be stirred within us as we consider the humility of our Saviour, his coming in the flesh, his dying on the cross and being buried in the tomb. Lord, we also want to thank you this morning that salvation didn't end there in the grave, but we thank you that our Saviour is risen and that all things will be put underneath his feet. We thank you that even during these days, these days of global pandemic, these days of COVID-19, we know, O oh Lord, that all things are underneath the feet of Jesus Christ, our Saviour. We thank you that he is King and Lord. We thank you that you are in control, O oh God, and you have a plan and purpose for everything. So help us in these days to continue to praise you and thank you for your majesty, your glory, and the great salvation that we have in and through Christ. This morning, O oh Lord, we also pray for those who mourn the loss of loved ones. Uh, Father, we pray in particular from our own congregation for the Colville family uh, on the passing of, of Jeff's dad. Lord, be with Jeff and Alison, Daniel, James and Anna. Uh, we pray for Mrs. Colville and Jeff's brothers and their families. Lord, draw close, comfort them and uphold them, strengthen them by the working of your spirit. Lord, we pray for those who are going through times of difficulty, those, O oh Lord, with health issues, those who have to self-isolate and have concerns about loved ones. 
O Lord, wrap your loving arms around them and care for them. We pray that in all things that we will be looking to Jesus Christ, that we might find our comfort and strength in him alone. Father, we continue to pray for our nation as a whole. Uh, and as this pandemic continues, O Lord, as we look ahead to the possible easing of lockdown, we ask that you might continue to humble our nation. O Lord, forgive our nation for not humbling itself in these days. Forgive our nation for continuing to ignore your commands, continuing to exalt human strength. O Lord, be gracious to us and bless us. Turn hearts and minds to yourself. Might your truth resound throughout our nation to your praise, glory and honour. Because we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. We want to read from God's word. We're turning to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And we'll be reading the first 11 verses. Philippians chapter 2, beginning our reading at verse 1. This is God's word. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. I want to talk to the boys and girls for a moment where you are at home, and we're going to be thinking about another Bible passage this morning. Last week we thought about one that was popular in our home, David and Goliath, and this week we're thinking about another Bible passage that's popular. And I have a picture to help us know what the Bible passage is. Here we have someone washing feet. And a long time ago, when people were walking around, they wouldn't have had nice comfy shoes to walk in. They walked either in bare feet or in sandals. And in the place where Jesus grew up, the roads weren't nice tarmac pavements like we have, but they were dusty and dirty. And so when people were walking, their feet got dirty. When you arrived at somebody's house, your feet had to be cleaned and washed. But it wasn't the owner of the house who would wash your feet. It wasn't the children of the house who had to wash the guests' feet. No, it was the lowest of the lowest slave. The least important slave. They were the one who had the responsibility of washing the feet of those who arrived. One night, Jesus and his friends were meeting together for a special meal. And as they arrived together at the house, the disciples were maybe looking at one another, wondering, which of us is going to have to wash 
each other's feet. I really hope it's not me. I don't like washing stinky feet, they were maybe thinking. I don't like washing dirty feet. And then, Jesus did something amazing. Jesus, their Lord and teacher, the great Jesus that they loved and looked up to, the one that they followed, their leader, he took off his outer garments. He tied a towel around his waist and he began washing his disciples' feet. Jesus said to them, Although you don't understand what I am doing now, soon you will understand. And I want you to follow my example. Later that night, Jesus and his friends shared a special meal together. And then the next day, Jesus was crucified on the cross. Jesus gave his life. But here in washing the disciples' feet, Jesus was teaching his disciples something very important. Jesus was saying, I have come into the world not so that people will put me on a throne, not so that people will raise me up, but so that I will become a servant and give my life. Jesus, who was the eternal Son of God, the one who always existed, the one who made all things, the great creator and sustainer, he made himself low. He made himself the lowliest servant. And he showed his disciples that he was going to do this by washing their feet. This morning, we're going to be thinking about what we call Christ's humiliation, or how Christ humbled himself, made himself low, how he took on the form of a servant, and how he went to the cross and died for our sin. But it's a wonderful, wonderful picture. And it teaches us some wonderful truths. The first truth that it teaches us is that Jesus came to serve us. Jesus loved us so much that he was willing to make himself nothing and die on the cross for our sin. How beautiful. How wonderful. The second thing it teaches us is what Jesus was teaching his disciples, that we are to be like Jesus. We are to put others before ourselves. We are to serve others. We're to not be afraid of making ourselves low to help other people. And boys and girls, I hope that you will be boys and girls who not only love Jesus, and understand that he came to give his life for you, which is so very important. But I hope that you're also going to be boys and girls who love to put others before yourself, who love to follow the example of Jesus. Now, we don't have to wash one another's feet, you'll be pleased to know. But we can put others first by thinking of them, by giving them what they need, by praying for them by loving them, by not taking what we want first, but letting others have the first choice. There are lots of ways that you can follow this example of Jesus, but we can only do that in knowing him and loving him and thanking him that he gave himself for us. We want to sing together again in praise we're turning to Psalm 22. Psalm 22, and we're singing stanzas 5 to 8. The tune is Gabriel number 90. The opening and the closing of Psalm 22 are recorded for us in the New Testament. They're the words that Jesus spoke on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And it ends with, it is finished, or he has done this. This psalm speaks clearly of the suffering of Jesus, the suffering that he endured on the cross. Jesus humbled himself for our sake, and he did it 
so that we might have life. From his being born into the world to his death and burial, Jesus humbled himself for us. We stand as we join together in praise again, singing from Psalm 22, singing stanzas 5 to 8. Let us worship God. Continuing our series in the Shorter Catechism, and we come this morning to two questions that deal with the incarnation and the humiliation of Jesus. That is Christ taking on flesh and suffering and dying for our sin. Question 22 asks, how did Christ, being the Son of God, become man? And question 27 asks, Wherein did Christ's humiliation consist? Now this word humiliation, it's one that we are familiar with. It means to be reduced to a state of lowliness or submission. Or it can refer to the emotion of someone whose status has been lowered. We can imagine the great sports team expected to beat the underdog. And yet on the day, it's the underdog that's successful and beats the stronger team out of sight. We say it was a humiliation. Or the up and coming politician who has stood for every just and right cause and yet one misplaced word 
one foolish action and suddenly they're ousted from the position they were in. Humiliation. We understand what humiliation is when those who have a high standing are brought down low. But what's most remarkable about the humiliation of Jesus Christ is that it was planned in eternity and that he was willing in his humiliation. The eternal Son of God willingly left the glories and the splendor of heaven to be born into this world, to be born under the law, to go to the cross, to die. And all the time, he had the power and the ability of not being humiliated in that way. Yet, he was humiliated for our sake. And so we come this morning to truths that are very dear to us. All the truths that we've been looking at in our studies of the Shorter Catechism are dear to us. And so they should be. But here at the cross, in Christ's humiliation, this is where we see all of what we've been looking at so far come together. Here we see the love that compelled Jesus to be our servant, to die in our place. Here we see the cost of God's love towards us as the eternal Son of God endured humiliation, suffering, death and burial. And he did it for undeserving men, women and children. Here are truths that are dear to us and move us. Christ Jesus became man. And he died for my sin. In Philippians chapter 2 verses 6 to 8. We have one of the best spirit inspired summaries of Christ's humiliation. It's a passage that's perhaps familiar to most of us. But one that we would never tire hearing. Jesus Christ who though he was in the form of God. Did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Three headings this morning as we focus our attention on the humbling or the humiliation of Jesus Christ. And so firstly, I want us to think about Christ's position before his humiliation. Christ's position before his humiliation. Question 22 asks, how did Christ, being the Son of God, become man? Before we look at the full answer to this question, I want us to do what the Catechism does for every single answer. And that is to restate the question. So the beginning of answer 22 is Christ, the Son of God, became man. Notice here that the question and the answer are telling us that before Jesus came to earth, he existed. The Son of God. Paul in Philippians 2 says of Jesus in verse 6, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. And this is the point at which we must begin. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He was in the form of God. This doesn't mean that Jesus was a type of God or that he was like God. No, in saying he was in the form of God, Paul is saying that Jesus has all the essential perfections of God. He is the very essence God. God the Son is infinite, eternal and unchangeable in his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness and truth. In Jesus Christ, the eternal qualities or the perfections of God have always existed. 
They've always been his perfections. He has all the glory of the Godhead because he is the Son of God. This was clear to the created angels in heaven that would then come to earth to announce the arrival of God on earth. Good news, for unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Scripture makes it clear that the Son of God is the eternal God of the same essence as the Father and the Spirit, one God, one being, three persons, all eternal, all one God. Like God the Father, Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega in the book of Revelation. The Bible tells us that all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. Jesus has no beginning. And so verse 6 of Philippians says he was in the form of God, the very essence, God. Verse 6 of Philippians 2 continues, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Here is one who has all power and authority one who is all glorious and yet he doesn't use his equality with God, the Father and Spirit, to snatch or gain power. As the Son of God, he doesn't reach out of his exalted position to grasp at authority. Jesus doesn't show any selfish ambition. He doesn't take advantage of his divine position. Probably the best way to explain this is as we look at the temptations of Jesus when he was on earth. He was in the wilderness and Satan came to him, calling on him to show his power, to turn the stones into bread, to jump off the temple and let the angels to attend to him. That Satan would then show him the kingdoms of the world and all that he would have to do would bow down and they would all be his. Christ could have done these things. He could have shown everyone that he is the Lord of glory. But there was no selfish ambition in Christ. The position is his. He could show his importance. But Jesus was willing to put his glory behind a veil. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Although this was his position, there was no selfish ambition with Jesus Christ. And friends, we must never forget this pre-incarnate condition of the Son of God. He didn't start lowly, because he is the Lord the creator, the sustainer. Jesus is the eternally righteous one, the one dwelling in perfect fellowship with the Father and the Spirit, one true God. We must never forget from where Christ came into the world, from the glories and the beauty and the splendor of heaven, eternally infinitely self-existent God, full of glory, dwelling in heavenly glory. Christ's position before his humiliation. Then secondly, we have here Christ's pattern in his humiliation. Christ's pattern in his humiliation. Philippians 2 verse 7 but emptied himself. Jesus steps into this world. Jesus is made incarnate, that is, he took on our flesh, born of a woman. Here is a selflessness, a 
humble attitude. Paul emphasizes that Christ is the willing party. Himself he emptied. Himself he made nothing. Now we have to be careful. This is not saying that Christ emptied himself of his deity. He didn't cease to become God. There's a famous hymn that says he emptied himself of all but love. But that's not true. That, that's false teaching. Christ Jesus didn't empty himself of his Godhead. He didn't empty himself of his eternal power and righteousness. Christ Jesus remained fully God. He didn't set his God nature to one side. He didn't empty himself of all but love. So what did Christ empty himself of? Well, it's his outer glory. The visible glory that is now veiled. In a sense, we could say that he emptied himself of his display of his glory. While Christ was on earth, he could have displayed his glory so everyone could see. He could have shown everyone that he is the eternal Son of God, but he didn't. He made himself nothing. He veiled his glory in human form. But himself he emptied, willingly having his glory veiled for a time. And he did this emptying by taking the form of a servant or the form of a slave, verse 7. Friends, this is humility. The King of glory becomes a servant. The Lord of creation veils his glory and takes the form of a servant. And he does this, Paul says, by being born in the likeness of men. The end of verse 7. There's now something more to Christ. He is the eternal Son of God. And he's now taken to himself the nature of humanity. He took to himself flesh. He took to himself a human nature alongside his divine nature. Paul uses the word appearance or likeness. This is a word that was used to describe the outward appearance of a king who exchanges his kingly robes for sack. But what Christ has done is so much more. The eternal Son of God veils his eternal glory in the sackcloth of human flesh. He entered into the miseries to suffer and the weaknesses of this life. Jesus knew what it was to suffer to hunger, to thirst, to sorrow. He knew what it was to feel extreme tiredness and pain and even death. He took off his outer robe and put on flesh. Not just any flesh, but took the position of the lowliest slave. Because he humbled himself. Verse 8. Right from the incarnation. Right from that time. The Holy Spirit. Came to Mary. And she conceived. Christ Jesus in her womb. Right from then. To his delivery there. In Bethlehem. Growing up in a poor family. Having to flee to Egypt. Go all the way up to poor Nazareth. And there, all the way through his life, through his sufferings, through his hunger and thirsting and sorrow, right to the point of suffering at the hands of wicked men and the point of death, he humbled himself. His sufferings and his beatings 
is being mocked. The cruel crucifixion, his death, and his burial. Jesus' entire life here on earth was one of complete and continuous humiliation and obedience. That's what we were singing about in Psalm 22. And it was his own doing. He humbled himself. Can you see it? From the glories of heaven down to earth, a servant, obedient, and then brought to the cross to die as a despised and rejected blasphemer. But this is the pattern. The rest of answer 22 of the shorter catechism says, He became a man by taking to himself a true body and a reasonable soul, being conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary, and born of her, yet without sin. Answer 27 expands on this further. Christ was humiliated by being born, and that into a low condition, into a poor family. Made under the law, undergoing the miseries of this life, the wrath of God, the cursed death of the cross, and being buried, and continuing under the power of death for a time. We could imagine the humiliation of Christ like being the first half of a parabola. A parabola is a, is a U-shaped curve, a, a graph, a, and it begins high up in glory, but then it descends and it reaches a bottom point before it will then return back up the curve. But Christ's humiliation is this first half, beginning in glory, and then coming in the flesh, being born as a man, that poor lowly family, and then Christ's suffering, the miseries of this life, his arrest, his trial, crucifixion, the burial. gets lowered down further and further. At the bottom of this graph is the cross and the tomb. The Lord of glory, the eternal Son of God, and he's fixed down here with nails through his arms on a cross, breathing his last being taken and lowered down even further, being laid in a tomb. And by being buried and remaining under the power of death for a time. His body remained in the grave. That's where the physical body of Jesus was those three days. In the tomb for a time. This is what it means by descending into hell, into the grave. Friends, this is the pattern or the picture of Christ's humiliation. From the glories and the beauty, the eternity of heaven, to death on a cross, placed in a tomb. And this forces us to ask the question, why? Why did he do it? And that brings us to our third heading this morning. Christ's purpose in his humiliation. Christ's purpose in his humiliation. The, the answer is both simple yet wonderfully glorious. It's both clear and yet entirely unsearchable. He did it for our sake. He did it to redeem us. During this time of the COVID-19 pandemic, we've heard many stories of people's selfless actions, people caring for others, loving others, helping others, and that is good. It's commendable. It's heartwarming. It's encouraging. But it's nothing compared to what Jesus Christ 
has done for us. We all deserve God's wrath and anger on our sin. Each one of us deserves eternal punishment in hell. None of us deserves grace and goodness. We are all filthy, stained, twisted, selfish, sinful men and women. Now you may not believe that about yourself, but outside of Jesus Christ, that is exactly what we are. But there's good news. Someone has stepped down into the muck and the mire of this world. And he not only identified himself with us, but he suffered for our rebellion. He took the punishment for our sin. He was counted among the unrighteous for our sake. And this person is none other than the eternal creator, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He paid the price that our sin deserves. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. For our sake he became poor, that we might be made rich. He's not only paid the price for our sin, but he has given us riches. He's given us eternal life through his humiliation, as we'll see next week, also through his exaltation. We still have to move up through this new graph to reach the pinnacle of the other side. But in his death, he's opened up a new and living way for us to approach God the Father. When Jesus died, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. This large veil that covered the Holy of Holies, this barrier into God's presence, it was removed that we might draw near. His humiliation, his lowering of himself, his humbling of himself, it was to open up the way into the Father's presence, the way of forgiveness, the way of new life, eternal life. And all of this was from his love towards us. He humbled himself because he loved us. Christ gave a picture of what he would do for his disciples. He laid aside his outer garments. He took onto himself the servant's towel. He tied it round his waist. He washed his disciples' feet to make them clean. Jesus was giving them a picture of what he was going to do. He was going to make them clean through his humbling of himself, through his death on the cross. His humiliation was for them. His love was for them. Imagine what it would be like being the disciples. How embarrassing. Wondering which one of them is going to have to be the lowly servant. Which one of us will have to wash one another's feet? Oh, I don't want it to be me. And then stepping forward is the eternal Son of God. He does it because he does it for them, because he loves them. If you're a Christian this morning, this is what Jesus Christ has done for you. He's lowered himself to death, even death on a cross. The King of all glory became the lowliest servant so that you might have so that you might have forgiveness. 
so that you would be with him for all eternity. If you're a Christian this morning, you need to know that out of love, Jesus Christ willingly left the glories of heaven and went to the cross for you. For your sake, he made himself nothing. He made himself poor so that you might be rich, so that you might have eternal life, the forgiveness of sins, and spend eternity in glory with your Lord and Saviour. Sometimes people think that the shorter catechism is dull, it's cold, it just doesn't have the warmth of other writings. Perhaps it's because maybe you were forced to learn it as a child, a young person, or maybe you are one of our young people and you're having to go through the catechism and you're thinking to yourself, why do I need to go through this? Because it's a glorious summary of the truth of what Jesus Christ has done for you. Here we have summarized what the Bible teaches and it summarizes for us this overwhelmingly praiseworthy and glorious truth that the eternal Son of God came and died for me. Maybe you're listening this morning and you've maybe learnt the shorter catechism as a child. Maybe all those years ago when they still taught it in school and not just Sunday school or Sabbath school. And maybe some of these words and phrases are coming back to you. But as of yet, you're still outside of Jesus Christ. Well, I would say to you this morning, look at what Christ Jesus has done. He left the glories of heaven to become the one who would die on the cross for sin. For our sin. How proud of us to think that we don't need him. How foolish of us to think that we can be made right by God through our own pitiful, feeble actions. Whereas Jesus says, here I am. I've come to do my Father's will. I came to give my life. To love this fallen world that you might be forgiven, that you might be made rich. And so I would say to you, if you haven't yet come to Jesus Christ, come to him and bow the knee to him today. Confess your sin before God the Father. Seek forgiveness through the one who made himself nothing, that we might have eternal life. Friends, nothing is more important than that. Christ's humiliation is good news for all who come to him in faith. Amen. Let us pray. Lord and Father, we thank you for this glorious truth that the eternal Son of God would so humble himself out of obedience to that divine plan and humble himself and become obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. We thank you that he did this for our sake. We thank you that he did this because he loved us even when we were so unlovable. We thank you that he loved us when we were unworthy. We thank you that he is the servant who removed his outer garment and took on our flesh to give himself. O Lord, may we love this truth. May we praise you for this truth. And may we also look more and more to Jesus, the servant and also the great king. And in him, May we indeed find life eternal, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We sing together again. We're 
turning to Psalm 69. Psalm 69, uh, we're going to be singing stanzas 15 to 17 and then 22 and 23. Psalm 69, stanzas 15 to 17 and then 22 and 23. The tune is Consolation number 66. Uh, all of the psalms are the songs of Jesus. And as we sing them, we sing not only of the experience of the psalmist, but we are singing ultimately of the experience of Jesus Christ. He is the one who took on flesh for us. He is the one who suffered for us. He is the one who became the sin bearer for us. He lowered himself because he loved us. In Psalm 69 we sing of the scorn and the disgrace that Jesus Christ went through. We sing about his heart breaking and him being faint. We sing about them giving him gall and vinegar to drink as they did on the cross. We sing of his distress and pain. But we sing also of praise to God because we know in this humiliation we have life and life eternal. Psalm 69 stanzas 15 to 17 and 22 and 23. Let us stand as we worship God. Rest and abide with each one of us, both now and forevermore. 